Welcome. Welcome, everyone, um, to our, our first uh, e-conference this fall. Before we get started, and Josh will introduce our featured speaker, just a quick note, we're going to talk today about open educational resources and access. Um, we wanted to mention another tool that has recently been made available through City um, on ex course accessibility. And so once we make our, our course materials available to everyone, we also want to make sure they're accessible to all of our students. There's a new tool available on campus called Ally. It just gives some feedback and help to you, you as an instructor to make sure your course materials are available and, and work for everyone. If anyone's interested at all in that tool, um, we're just doing kind of a, a pilot with a small group of students, um, or, or with instructors. And then just send an email to accessibility at usu.edu, and we'll get you set up and, uh, and with that. And you can get started and give us some feedback on it. We'll, we'll have some more information coming. Uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Joshua Toms. I'm an associate professor of Spanish and applied linguistics here at Utah State University. And I'm delighted to see so many people carving out some time um, during uh, this fall semester, which is busy fall semester with lots of interesting talks and panels. Um, and I'm really happy to uh, present to you or introduce to you today our speaker. Um, uh, Dr. Rajiv Jangiani is the University Teaching Fellow in Open Studies and a Psychology Professor at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Vancouver, British Columbia, where he conducts research in open education and the scholarship of learning. A recipient of the Robert E. Knox Master Teacher Award from the University of British Columbia and the Dean of Arts uh, Teaching Excellence Award at KP, K, KPU, Dr. Giangiani serves as an open education advisor to BC campus, an associate editor of psychology, learning, and teaching, and an ambassador for the Center for Open Science. His books include A Compendium of Scales for Use in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, published in uh, 2015, and Open, the Philosophy and Practices that are Revolutionizing Education and Science, uh, which was uh, published this year. <coughs> You can find him online at his Twitter handle there, <laughs> that psych prof, or at that psych prof, uh, dot com. Uh, And just as a reminder, um, Reggie will be talking until 3.30, uh, and then following that, following a short break, we will have a hands-on workshop for anyone interested in finding out more about locating uh, open educational resources for your discipline, uh, looking at the various uh, repositories that are now available to everybody. And that's here in the same room, uh, starting at 4, and it will end at 5. So please help me welcome uh, Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I need that, but yeah. Thanks very much. You are, that was quite extraordinary, because I, I very rarely does somebody who I meet you know, for the first time practically pronounce my last name that well. So. <laughs> And this is precisely why I, my, I don't go by with, uh, with my last name on my Twitter handle or my website, because it's just complicated. And that psych prof is a lot easier. Um, so sh I should say I'm really happy to be here, um, not just at Utah State University for the first time, but in the state of Utah for the first time. Um, and so it's been lovely, although it looked like I brought the Canadian weather with me. Um, anyway, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and thank you also for taking your time uh, out to, to be here. Uh, I hope to spend the next hour or so playing with some ideas with you, talking about not just resources, but practices, and how these kinds of practices are not just uh, things that support social justice, something that matters a great deal to me, uh, but also very much supports pedagogical innovation. Uh, and we, they, we should have a good amount of room to, to have some discussion and Q&A at the end as well. Uh, but just in case you're tempted to sort of scribble down that nugget of wisdom that's on, the, uh, on a particular slide, uh, please know I'm going to be tweeting out a link to uh, my slides. They will be available uh, and openly licensed. So certainly, if you want to repurpose them in any way, you will be able to do that with your colleagues. Um, I would be a poor ambassador for open if I didn't practice it myself. Um, but I want to begin with something that's different. Uh, I want to begin with a, a bit of a personal story, if you'll indulge me. Um, so you can probably tell from, from my accent, I didn't grow up in Canada. Uh, I grew up in a small town in India called Bombay. Uh, it's only about 25 million people thereabouts. Uh, interesting place to grow up, certainly. Um, and I should say, growing up, I enjoyed 
a fair degree of privilege. Um, family was quite wealthy, we had staff. It was the sort of world where you don't realize that the world outside your doors is going to be really different. So you grew up with that. And then, of course, privilege is one of these things where you don't realize you have it until you lose it, at least in part. And that's what happened. Um, unfortunately, my father suffered a series of um, uh, prob health problems, um, suffered a series of heart attacks, and passed away well, as I was growing up. Financial difficulties ensued, um, and our family lost our home. So suddenly, from leading a, a rather privileged existence within this little bubble, I, my future was completely uncertain. Uh, and it was that, at that time that my grandparents took me in. So my grandfather, in particular, uh, looked after me. Otherwise, I would have essentially been homeless at the time. So he was the one who supported my uh, decision to move across the world, literally, um, to study. So I, I went to Vancouver as an international student. And I don't know how familiar you are with the plight of international students um, on the front of extraordinarily high tuition fees, of course, but also in terms of um, restrictions, in terms of what they can do, visas. One of the restrictions on me, um, and I love the fact that this is so flexible, uh, <laughs> that one of our participants is very cozy. <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> the reality of mine uh, was that in Vancouver, I couldn't work outside of my campus. Um, there were only a few jobs I could get on my campus. And it took me about a year or so before I could get out of that usual loop, you know, where people ask you for local work experience but you don't have that until you get the first option, the first opportunity to accumulate that local work experience. So about, about a year in, I managed to get one of the few jobs on campus, um, and I started to be able to pay my own tuition. But I want you to sort of try to appreciate at this point how motivated I was to do well, because this was my only shot, essentially. Um, I knew that every semester I worked hard, and every semester I hit the dean's list, those letters of commendation went to India, to my grandfather's home, because he was the one paying my tuition bills. So I was really motivated to do well. So it was when I started to be able to pay for my own tuition that he visited. He came with my, with my grandmother and they visited with me. Uh, it was a summer in Vancouver, which is absolutely gorgeous. They were with me for about three weeks. And then they went on to Massachusetts, where his brother lives. And they were meant to stay there for about two weeks. But they cut short that trip. And about 10 days in, they left. My grandmother wanted to go back home to India. And as they were flying home, there was fog that was uh, enveloping Bombay, so they, they were rerouted to New Delhi, where, as it turns out, uh, their other daughter lives. So they spent the night with their other daughter, uh, the first daughter being my mom, who was with me in Vancouver by the time. And they spent the night with her. Went back to Bombay the next day. Seven days later, my grandmother passed away. Ten days after that, my grandfather passed away. And to me, this was a really bittersweet memory. Because on the one hand, of course, it's sad. On the other hand, you know, of course, they'd been married for more than 50 years. Clearly, my grandmother wanted to be home. But incredibly few people get a chance to have that level of closure just before someone so close to them passes. And not only that, the fog ensured that they met every member of the closest family before they died, which is incredible. So I'm sharing this story because without my grandfather's faith in me, without his support of my education, I would not have been in Vancouver as an international student. I would not have become a Canadian citizen. I would not have become a university professor. I certainly wouldn't be here in front of you. At the same time, I have to say, when I think about higher education more broadly, I'm concerned that we're relying too much on families that are as supportive as mine was. And that stories like mine are becoming all too rare. So before I go too much further, I want to just point out this image. Um, the picture that looks in the background of this title slide. Does anyone recognize what mountain range this is? It's not in North America. We'll come back to that. I'll leave you in suspense for a little bit. But let me start by saying this. I believe that higher education is a vehicle for economic and social mobility. And I say that because that's really my lived experience. I believe that it is an incredible tool to unlock human potential. At the same time, I confess the more I examine the structure of higher education, the more I see that it's actually structured in a way that reinforces and replicates existing power structures. 
And this is something that worries me terribly. Like I said, stories like mine are becoming all too rare now. Few people realize there's actually language embedded within the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights concerning the importance of equal access to higher education. This is Article 26, by the way. And even when we think about this, I think our minds immediately go to the third world or to places like where I grew up, where there's not enough seats for the number of students or maybe there's infra insufficient infrastructure. But I'm talking about here, North America, Canada, the United States, Utah State University. In this country, this is according to a study commissioned by the Department of Education, in just the first decade of this century, 2.4 million students could not attend or complete college because of the cost barrier. These are students who were qualified in every way. They took the right classes, they had the right grades, it was just cost that was their barrier. So this is what I mean by the structure of higher education itself. And it's not a huge surprise, of course, if you've been working in higher ed for any time at all, you'll be well aware of the gradual pullback in state appropriations for higher ed funding certainly across this country, and especially in light of the financial crisis uh, about a decade ago. Now, of course, there's been a slight recovery since then, but you can also see that there's been an increasing amount of burden being placed on students in the form of tuition. So that's been going up. This is a snapshot of the nation. If you're interested in what Utah looks like, there you go. Really, really similar to the nation as a, as a whole. So even though Utah does fairly well in this country on a variety of benchmarks, you're not that different on average. But this is still hard to process. So I spent some time on your website, and this is what I dredged up. Now, of course, when I say cost of attendance, I'm not just talking about tuition. I'm talking about this is an in-state student, what your website says, would, uh, would have to spend for a year of studies, including room and board on campus. So on campus, okay? Living on campus, food, tuition, of course, other fees, and books and materials. That's what that costs for one year, okay? And then here's a little exercise. Imagine you have a student over here working a minimum wage job. The question for me is how many hours would it take this student working a minimum wage job to pay for one year of their education? Assume they do not have a family like mine, right? This is your answer. And if you translate this into a per week number, there you go. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is if plan A is just be born in a wealthy family, not a great plan. Plan B work, and of course our students are working at numbers that we never had to work at as because of this. But there are not enough hours in the day to work and actually go to school. I'm sure you're well aware of how many of your students are trying to hold down part-time and often full-time jobs while they're going to school. So what do we do if we can't pay for it through work? Third option, anyone? Ah, says the student in the room, excellent. Indeed, I see dead people. But do you? We don't realize how many of our students require a student loan to be in the classroom. More than 40% of, of Utah State University students require a student loan right now. Right? That's a big number. Average debt from your students, in fact, is about $19,000. That's just on average. Now, mind you, that's lower than the, than the national average by some, by some distance. It's still quite high. So that's in 2015. Uh, that's uh, now close to about $19,000, and as I said, over 40%. It's gone from 47 to 41% over the last couple of years, which is great. So you're doing well relative to the rest of the nation, but you have to know your nation is doing really poorly relative to the rest of the world. But it's not just the immediate debt. You have to think about what follows. How long does it take students to pay off those loans? Right? Think about how every one of our campuses have student wellness programs. What are the mental health implications of this kind of debt? What happens to the delaying of life milestones? How many more years are they waiting to get married, to buy a house, to settle down because of this debt? Those are some of the questions for me. This is a marketing campaign that I will never forget. My alma mater, the University of British Columbia, had, had this marketing campaign. They wanted, wanted to celebrate the students who were graduating. So around convocation, they put these posters on campus, and they give students these markers. You know, fill in your most memorable experience. That's not what they were hoping was going to happen, but that's the picture that went viral, of course. But this is the reality. This is the reality of today's students. And I'm not going to belabor this point too much, but I will point you to this. There's a couple of resources. If you're interested in learning about the reality of students today, 
and the implications of this. This is an, a really, really brilliant resource. Uh, Sarah goldrick Rab was formerly at Wisconsin-Madison, and now she's at Temple University, uh, a wonderful scholar. Uh, and she published this book uh, less than a year ago called Paying the Price. And I think it really lays bare uh, the price that students in the United States are paying to try and access and benefit from higher education. One of the most important uh, manifestations of this uh, that she highlights is food insecurity. So I'll point you to another report if you're interested in this, in this as well. This was published uh, just under a year ago as well. Um, again, nationally representative sample. More than half of the students in that sample report some degree of food insecurity in the preceding 30 days. And again, if you're thinking, well, I can, I can see how that's the case. You know, maybe community colleges in inner cities. But no, actually, that's the case at USU. You may be familiar with SNAC. Student Nutrition Access Center on campus, which has seen an 80% increase in its use by students over the last year. This is here at USU. Right. So I want you to think about this because when we get those emails from students at the start of every semester, around now, maybe even two weeks ago, you know, hey prof, right, do I really need the book? May I use an older edition? I want you to think about the food insecurity that's lurking behind that. Because right. when it comes to, to living, whether it's on campus or off campus, students can't say easily, I'm not going to pay rent. They can choose to starve themselves, though. That's what they do. When it comes to tuition, they can't say, I'm not going to pay tuition. But they can say, I'm going to try to see how far I can go in this course without buying the books. And that's what they do. So there's a parallel there. So that's why I'm talking about books. There's actually a couple of reasons. Even though this is not the biggest piece of the pie, right? as an individual faculty member, I cannot, I don't think you can, influence tuition or cost of living. But as faculty, this we control. Required course materials, we are the only people who control this. Thank goodness for academic freedom. But control is not the only reason why I'm highlighting this. The other reason is that if you look at consumer goods across the board, there is actually no other consumer good, period, that has risen in costs as much as academic textbooks. None. More than 1,000% since 1977, and it doesn't matter. You can look at the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is a public government website, of course. I can tell you, I've spent a lot of time there. You can look at the last five years, the last 10 years, any period of time. It's always been more than three times the rate of inflation, the cost of textbooks going up, more than anything else. Okay. So those are two reasons. We now live in the era of the $400 textbook, sorry to say. And that's not an isolated example. Here's another one. Although I might be picking on one particular publisher today. Right. This is deeply problematic. Now, at my institution, tuition, right, I, I work at a public undergraduate institution. Right? We are an open admissions institution. Our mandate is to serve. So tuition is low. Tuition at our institution is $400 for a three-credit course. Textbooks can be $400 for a three-credit course. And so I think there's only one appropriate reaction to a $400 textbook, and I think this is it. <laughs> I love that reaction. It's great. And this is why students across the country, in fact, across the continent, have launched a social media campaign. So if you look for the hashtag textbook broke, at the start of every semester, you'll see students coming out of bookstores across the country, tweeting out pictures of their receipts to show the world how much they've spent on textbooks for a single semester. They'll have whiteboards like this, where they list how much they've spent on textbooks. Too much, some students writing in, right? I don't know if you can see the one at the bottom. How much did you spend? My firstborn. <laughs> right? And it's funny, of course, but then it's not so funny. We have a principal agent problem. We are the ones who make the decisions about the required course materials. We are not the ones who suffer the consequences of that decision. This is why our best estimates are about 35% of faculty actually have no idea what the cost is of the resources they've assigned. This is a problem. So when we list certain textbooks, let's say, as required in our syllabi, of course, our students do what students will do. They're creative. They're bright. They'll find all sorts of ways to get around that. There's fewer and fewer students buying brand new hardcover copies at the bookstore. right? They'll buy used copies if it's possible, if there's not a new edition that's come out during the summer, essentially. Or they'll resell at the end of the semester if possible, if there's not a new edition that's come out midway through the semester, rendering their $200 textbook worth $10. 
they'll buy online, they'll rent. A lot of students are now sharing purchases, which is, of course, uh, not particularly optimal. I used to photocopy. A lot of them are realizing that they can buy so-called international editions of textbooks, which are essentially the same content at a fraction of the cost, and increasingly old editions of textbooks. And I don't know about you, but when a student emails me and says, hey, may I use the fourth edition or the third edition or whatever it is, I go in with the usual cautionary tale, right? Well, you know, you're free to do whatever you like. Of course, I'd prefer for you to have something than nothing. However, we're, you're going to be assessed based on the current edition. You are responsible for any mismatch in content and so on, right? The usual caution. But sometimes, really, I can't argue with them. <laughs> this is an actual student at the University of Minnesota who was assigned an $85 French textbook. They went to Amazon and they bought not just the previous edition, but two editions older for $8. This was their rationale. And really, can you disagree? But of course, they know they're taking an academic risk because increasingly it's not just about the textbook, it's about any related resources that are mapped onto the textbook. Perhaps there's an access code that's packaged with the textbook for an online homework solution platform that perhaps does auto grading as well. Isn't that wonderful? It makes our life a little bit easier. But that means they can't buy the used books. That means they're really stuck. So the real calculus of the undergraduate degree is this. Is 10% of my grade coming from the access code? If so, I'll take the hit on my grade. If it's 35% of my grade that's coming from the access code, I can't take the hit. So I'm going to drop the class. I'm going to take another class, or I'm really going to suffer. That's what's happening, right? In increasing numbers, they're even illegally downloading their books. This is a screenshot of one of the, those illegal torrent sites. The message that you're looking at over here is from the student who took the time to scan and upload completely illegally a textbook from Pearson. But look at the message. Penn State, which is where this happened, you are gouging your students. We'd be willing to pay a fair price for this book, but that'd be far south of the $200 you charge at the bookstore. Fix this, lower the tuition a bit, and maybe students like me won't spend several days scanning your uh, materials and putting it online. Also clean the bathrooms, which I think is... It's just great. It's just like a catch-all for all the complaints. But the point is this. The system is actually making it so that students think that this, risking prosecution, is a preferable way, is a preferred way of getting access to the course materials. And again, as faculty, we can make this better or we can make this worse. Right? One of the ways we can make this worse, of course, students are well aware of this, is reflected in a very dark corner of the internet. I don't know if you know about this. Very dark corner called RateMyProfessor.com. This is a real profile. I didn't invent this, by the way. This exists. Somebody's made a profile for Master Yoda, who apparently works at the American University. As you can see, uh, very helpful, but not particularly clear, which makes sense. No chilies for Yoda. All right. But the point is this. RateMyProfessor has been using tags for a long time. One of the tags they use is requires a textbook. Another tag is actually uses the assigned textbook. Because there's nothing more frustrating for a student than spending $200 on a textbook and then being in this situation. Yes? This is one of the ways in which we can make this much worse. This is where the principal agent problem creates a larger problem. So, these are the best data we have concerning what students are doing with textbooks. These data come from a very large survey of more than 20,000 students in this sample uh, from Florida. This is the Florida Student Textbook Survey. They've done this twice in 2012 and again in 2016. Sample draws students from every single degree granting institution in that state. These are the numbers. Two thirds of them, or thereabouts, rec uh, report that they're not purchasing at least one of their required course textbooks because of cost. That's how that sentence ends. Close to 50% are taking fewer courses or not registering for a specific course because of textbook costs. Earning a poor grade, about 38%. Dropping a course, about 26%. Failing a course, about 20%. Right? These numbers are very stable. They've, in fact, gone slightly worse in a couple of categories since 2012. Very stable. Re similar research, similar questions have been asked of USU students. And when it comes to things like do not purchase a required course textbook, I looked at the data this morning. I was given a preview, a survey of about 700 and something, 68 students or so at USU. It was 69% at USU. I have not purchased a required course textbook for at least one of my courses because of cost. That's USU. So it's very stable. So this is the reality. And I think we're not especially aware of this, of the scale of the problem. And as I said, 
This gets even worse when you talk about access codes that remove some of the more affordable alternatives for students, like used copies and so on. But often, if you're like me, and you get those friendly knocks on your office door from you know, marketing representatives from commercial publishers, and they come in and, you know, I have good relationships with, well, many of them anyway. Um, and of course, they're showcasing their wares, and I immediately start a conversation about affordability. And have you ever had this conversation with them? If you have this conversation with them, you know they'll respond in a couple of ways. They'll say, yes, of course, this is why we have uh, soft cover versions. This is why we have loose leaf binder versions. This is why we have the ebooks. Yes? The ebooks. Ebooks, I'm going to say, are a wolf in sheep's clothing for a variety of reasons. One is when students purchase an ebook, it may be 60% of the cost of a hardcover. But be wary, students do not buy ebooks, they lease ebooks which means they lose access after 90 days, 120 days, whatever period it is. They never own the book. So if you're a student taking anatomy and physiology and you plan to go on to medical school, too bad. You're going to lose, you're going to lose access to that reference. Right? Forget that for a minute. You're also locked within digital rights management, right? which means you can't copy and paste, which means there are restrictions on how much you can print from ebooks. And this also means that your office that deals with services for students with disabilities has to go through incredible work to try and make the textbook backwards compatible for students who need assistive learning technologies. These books are not accessible. We're systematically excluding students from the population. And on the cost front, because you can't resell a book that you're leasing, students who lease e-textbooks often end up spending more than students who purchase a hard copy and are able to resell it at the end of the semester. Wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm going to say that again. So be wary of that. And this is precisely why I'm such a proponent of open educational resources, which of course is a massive category. This includes a whole suite of, type of resources, not just, not just books. But I should say, if you're familiar with OER, or perhaps you think you're familiar with OER, most people conflate open educational resources with resources that are online and free. And that's completely incorrect. OER don't have to be online. They can be offline. They can be print copies, for example. And OER, yes, they can be free, but they are not just free. They're beyond free. The thing that makes OER OER are the permissions that come with open educational resources, not the free. And the permissions are called the five R's. So first is the permission to reuse. This is the most important from an educational perspective. You, we are free, unfettered reuse. We can use these resources in any way. We can use them, our students can reuse them. We do not need to write to the author to request permission to include them in a course package. No, you've got permission in advance, right? From a faculty perspective, here's what's cool. You can revise and remix. This is really neat. We no longer have to bend our courses to map onto the table of contents of a textbook. We can modify the instructional resources to suit our pedagogical goals, which is frankly what we should have been doing all along. We have academic freedom. Right? I don't have to, to tell my students, don't read chapter 11, take it out. If there's something missing, I'm going to add it in. If there's a statistic or a local cultural reference, perhaps, that's a little out of date, I can update that myself. If you teach political science, you're going to want to update your textbook probably you know, every week, given the current political <laughs> climate. But the point is you have the freedom to do it. Right? And the beauty is you're not locked within digital rights management. So students who need the book to be accessible have full access to it. That's really powerful. And then for students, of course, the other two R's are incredibly important. They can retain the resources forever. They're not leasing them. They have them. And they can share them with their family, with their peers, with their networks. It doesn't matter. They have it. These are the five R's. So just being online and just being free to access is not that great. You can go to CNN.com. It's free online content. It's completely copyrighted. You can't really use it in many ways in an educational setting. You certainly can't adapt it nor retain it. Right? This is why OER is so powerful. Free is one of the consequences, and free is a game changer for students. But for faculty, it's a lot more than free. It's freedom. So Creative Commons licenses lie uh, at the foundation of open educational resources. This is a type of licensing that lies between fully all rights reserved copyright and things that are entirely in the public domain. So you'll often see these kinds of symbols, look a bit like hieroglyphics, I guess, um, in materials that are openly licensed. So I'll briefly explain what these are. And once you know what these are, you'll be able to recognize them all over the web, because you've encountered this already. This is the most important. These are essentially clauses in a license. 
And the person who creates something, whether it's a textbook or anything else, can choose in advance how they're comfortable with other people using their work. This one, give me credit. This means attribution. You can use this in any way, but you have to say where you got it from. You can't pass this off as your own work, for example. So it's basic citation, right? NC, you don't have to include this, but you could. You can use this in any way, but you're not going to make a profit of my label. So you're not going to take the textbook that I worked on and sell it on Amazon for 5,000 bucks. Non-commercial clause, right? This one, you can use it in any way you like. You can modify it. You can translate the book into French if you like. But then, once you do that, you're going to share a like, which means share that back with the commons, with the same open license as you received it. You're not the only person who's going to benefit from your work. Everyone's going to benefit from your work. Share a like. And finally, very rare to see this, but this means no derivatives, which means you can use this, but you can't make any changes to it. And sometimes that's important, whether you're teaching um, law for certain clauses or maybe for creative writing or something else. You don't want people to change your work. That's fine. But that's what you'll see. So when I say OER, again, I'm not just talking about textbooks. You could be talking about images. Here's a great example. If you teach art history, or if you've ever taken a course in art history, you'll know art history textbooks are among the most expensive because of the rights, permissions, royalties involved. It's incredibly expensive. But this is an example of Vincent van Gogh's self-portrait. The Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands owns the copyright, and they've released it into the public domain. This is OER. You can download a 300 megabyte version of this image, masterpiece, for free. You can print a wall-sized poster of this. You'll just be paying the cost of printing. This is OER. And the Rijksmuseum is not the only museum that's done this. The New York Metropolitan Museum of Art has done this. A whole suite of other museums have done this as well. So think about images when you think about OER as well. If you talk about videos, you can go to the world's most popular search engine, YouTube, and you can find videos over there that are openly licensed. Right? People don't realize that actually YouTube includes a filter where you can select only or search only for Creative Commons licensed videos. And the beauty of those is that when you get those, and there's hundreds of thousands of these, is that you don't have to install some sketchy plugin in your browser to download it just in case the link goes dead, but I wouldn't want to use this in my teaching. No. CC licensing means you can download it legally. You can keep it legally. You can modify it and revise it and remix the video in YouTube. They have an editor for free, legally. That's the power of this. TED Talks, I don't know if you're familiar with these. Occasionally, they are, these are used in education, right? Sort of bite-sized, sort of almost like glib solutions to other complex problems. Some of them are not awful, right? I think that should be the tagline, TED Talks. Some of these are not awful. But there you go. Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. This is OER. That's why you can download TED Talks directly from TED's website. These are OER, yes? If you teach, eh, heavens, if you use uh, simulations to teach any of the STEM disciplines, go to the University of Colorado's website, look for FET. These are interactive simulations, all of them openly licensed. You can download them, customize them, embed them in Canvas, your LMS, whatever you like, legally. Your students do not have to pay a cent to access these wonderful interactive resources, open educational resources, simulations. Yes. These are just examples. I could go on in each category. If you teach English literature, right? imagine you teach Shakespeare. This has been in the public domain for a few centuries now. right? Shakespeare's collected works. So essentially, when we ask students to, to purchase a commercial copy of Shakespeare, we're essentially asking them to fork over $100 for a new preface that's been written every three years by a scholar. And maybe that's really worthwhile, but maybe it isn't. Right? Project Gutenberg has digitized tens of thousands of classics of English literature, available in a wide variety of digital formats. This is OER. This is not a textbook, it's literature. Right? And of course, textbooks. And I'm sharing this example because this is one of the textbooks that I worked on. As you can see, research methods in psychology, but there's a story here. This is a Canadian edition. That matters because the laws governing uh, uh, um, ethics, so human research ethics, different in Canada and the United States. We answer to different bodies. There are different procedures involved. So we couldn't use the US edition. Also, in case you're aware, my discipline has been going through a somewhat of a replication crisis. So we had to talk about that. We wanted to talk about open science practices, the move towards reproducibility. We could do all of that. So we made all of those changes, made it a Canadian edition, released it. 
This book was a textbook that existed, a US edition of Research Methods in Psych. We adapted it and released it, and now students are using it across the country, which is great. Wide variety of digital formats, so it doesn't matter if students are using a tablet, a phone, a laptop, it doesn't matter. They have digital access in a wide variety of formats. And print, too. And with the cost of printing being the cost of printing, typically it's 80 cents on the dollar that goes back to the commercial publishers as, as profit, as royalty. So this means the 400 page research methods in psychology book cost my students $13. That's it, professionally bound, soft cover, $13. And when it's that price, they buy it. Right? If you're looking for textbooks, though, this is what I'll point you to. The Open Textbook Library is part of the Open Textbook Network. This is based at the University of Minnesota, and they've been gathering open textbooks for a wide variety of disciplines. They have more than 400 of these already. You'll find them right here. And the lovely thing about these books is not only are they complete books that you can download, that you can adapt, these are books that are openly reviewed. So when you go in, you'll often see peer reviews from colleagues with their names and institutional affiliations transparently written. Every review is up there. Even negative reviews are up there. Because if there's any changes, adaptations that need to be made, we need to know what's wrong with the book. It's all up there. Right? And you can access any of it at any moment. This is not a movement that's about compelling anybody to adopt a resource that they don't think is good enough. This is about a movement that's trying to inform people of an alternative, a new option. Not taking away any commercial option, but a new option. And if you find a resource that's been funded, that's been peer reviewed, that's available with ancillary resources, that is relevant to a discipline you teach, consider adopting it. That is literally it. And there's research. So actually at this point, this is not the only study, but I wanted to show you a couple of studies to show you what the research says about the efficacy of the adoption of open textbooks on educational outcomes. There's 16 published studies at this point. This is one of the largest ones. Um, so Lane Fisher, who led this study, works at Brigham Young University. Um, and as you can see, this is quasi-experimental. If you're interested in research design, we can talk about propensity score matching and what that is. But the sample is massive, right? Almost 17,000 students at 10 institutions, including institutions in Utah. And as you can see, when you have students assigned open educational resources, in this case, open textbooks, compared with those who are assigned commercial textbooks for the same courses, you find lower withdrawal rates, you find students more likely to pass with a C minus or better, and you're able to use it as a prerequisite, and you're finding a bump in enrollment as well. The remarkable thing, even though this is a large study, this is only one of 16 studies, as I said. Right? And it doesn't matter. The 16 studies have taken place at different institutions, different types of institutions, from community colleges to R1 institutions, different disciplines, depending on which subjects are being investigated. I've, done an, I've led one at my institution, although not in my classes, because clearly I'm a passionate advocate. So I had to recruit a bunch of faculty who are willing to do this. We randomly assigned sections and so on. We found the same result as every other one of the 15 studies. Students assigned OER perform the same or better than those assigned commercial textbooks. It's incredible. Imagine students paying $200 for a textbook are performing at best the same, if not worse, than those paying nothing. That's what the research is showing us. This is why I like this rubric. So my friend David Wiley, who used to work here, who now works at Lumen Learning, uh, came up with this rubric. And I modified it a bit because he had the y-axis going up to $200 for textbooks, and now it's about $400. So y-axis, cost to students, how much are they spending on materials? X-axis over here, what is the percentage of students in the course completing with a C or better? So mad, glad, sad, rad, and I've grayed out sad and glad because they're kind of boring, right? I mean, you know, so if a student doesn't buy the books, right, they, they forego that. So I'm going to try and do the course without buying the required course textbook. They're spending nothing, right? And they do badly. Well, that's sad, but no one's surprised, yes? Let's say they buy the book and the access code, and they do well. Well, they're glad, but no one's surprised. That's what we expect would happen, right? But Consider the case of Mercy College, where the students were previously assigned uh, a commercial textbook for math, along with an online platform called My Math Lab. Is that familiar to anyone? 48% of students in that model were passing the course with a C or better. They flipped to an open textbook for math, really good one from OpenStax, and they wanted the online platform for homework, and there is one. It's called My Open Math. It's a wonderful platform that exists. It's well-supported. 
And the cost of students for that is just $5 for the MyOpenMath access. But that's it. So they went from $187 to $5 in cost. And suddenly, 62% of students were passing with the C or better. And that's the difference between MAD and RAD. Right? And again, it doesn't matter where you go, the research is saying the same thing. This is what I saw on my anonymous course evaluations the first semester I began adopting open textbooks. And I love that you know, some of them are highlighting that it's free, saving them money. Of course, that matters to students, and I don't want to underplay that. But I love the comment in the middle. And that's the one that really matters to me, especially at an open access school, especially as a school that serves the community. Right? That's the student I really want to reach right there. So this is me now, although maybe in a few years. I don't always assign a textbook, right? I teach upper level courses for which there is no textbook. It's a niche area. So I'm accustomed to putting together articles, chapters, custom course packages. But when I do, I certainly prefer that it be open for a variety of reasons. And again, significant cost savings to my students is in some ways for me the least significant benefit of open. It's much more than that. So quick summary of where we've been so far. For students, Huge win, of course, with OER, because we're talking about cost savings. We're talking about access broadly construed, including accessibility. And of course, we're talking about elevated course performance. For faculty, of course, it's this new layer of academic freedom, where suddenly we can adapt, localize, customize, contextualize the resources, embed our assignments within the book itself, do whatever we like. That's fantastic. And then finally, for institutions, huge, huge ben benefits in terms of enrollment, absolutely but also persistence in the course, and finally completion. Your faculty are already doing this, and so I was very pleased as I was preparing for my visit over here, I went online, and I found this video that was produced only a few days ago. Take a look. Some of your colleagues you might recognize. Open Educational Resources, also commonly called OER, um, are teaching and learning resources that reside in the public domain or are released often under a Creative Commons license, and that permits their you know, repurposing, remixing, reusing by others. Initially, my motivation for using OER was to save my students some money. Uh, they spend upwards of $200 for a textbook for each class, um, and a lot of that material is available online. Uh, so I thought uh, adopting OER for this course would be a good way to, to save them some money and, and get that same information into the classroom. As I continued to, to get involved in, in adopting OER and implementing it in the course, I realized there were some other advantages as well. And what I found was that in some of the traditional publisher-produced texts, some of that information was outdated oftentimes, and it took kind of a narrow view of, of aspects related to Hispanic linguistics. So I was sort of naturally and have been for a number of years sort of supplementing my courses with other types of materials that are more current and updated. So when the open education movement sort of came along, it was kind of a natural thing that happened and coincided with what I was already doing. We had, in some cases, the readings were an article that had just come out you know, sometimes the day before or just last week. And when the OER was so relevant like that, it made the learning and it made the class so much more real. Where are they going to be in 10 years because they took my course? Are they still going to be looking at the same 10-year-old textbook that was 10 years old when I taught it? Or are they going to have taken in the bedrock foundation that I laid and have become the competent professionals that will reflect back on me? The great thing is, is that at Utah State University, we, we, we have a lot of resources available to faculty to assist them. Uh, we have specialists uh, here in the library. Uh, we have instructional designers in our Center for Innovative Design and Instruction. All of that support structure is available for faculty where if they say, I'd like to explore using OER, or I think I'm interested. That support structure envelops them. So it might just be offering one class of their whole schedule, but if that one class can mean a decrease in cost and a way for one or two students to be able to stay in and continue that semester, then it's a success.
Great video, by the way. And the champion over here is actually not with us. She's traveling at a conference right now. But I'm sure she'd be happy if you contacted her when she returns. But having said all of that, I've only been talking about resources and not practices. And this is not a movement that's just about access to knowledge. It is about access to knowledge creation. Right? This is where we're going to talk about open educational practices. So I want you to consider this image for a moment. This image is actually in the public domain, so it's technically OER, but that's not the point. This is an image from a French book from about 100 years ago where they were predicting the classroom of the future, it, actually specifically the classroom of the year 2000. Does anything jump out at you in this image? What stands out? What seems odd or funny? Yeah, the cranking. Becky? Feeding the books? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So of course you've got the um, professor who looks like everyone's archetype of a professor, feeding received wisdom, or at least that which is considered valid enough to be published and printed into some sort of a electronic relay system. You can see that the real manual label, there's your teaching assistant, by the way. <laughs> and then somehow it's magically being transferred into the students' minds. It looks a lot like content delivery, yes, but there's no evidence of active learning, no peer assessment, collaboration. There's not even any need to take notes, actually. And the students look like they're just as privileged as the faculty. It's interesting. So it looks ridiculous, right? It's like, ha, ah, this is funny. But I, I'm going to suggest that it's actually not that different from what education looks like today. Majority of people still lecture. Majority of people still don't use active learning. But let's go further than that. This really reminds me, if you're familiar with Paulo Freire, the Brazilian philosopher, educator, of his banking model of education. So I'm going to read a little bit from, for you from his book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It, he's talking about the banking model of education, turns them, the students, into containers to be filled by the teacher. The more completely she fills the receptacles, the better a teacher she is. The more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. Education thus becomes the act of depositing, in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is its depositor. In the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. There's so much to unpack in that. And there's much to talk about. I think we can talk about all of the levels at which we exclude students from education, where we completely employ the banking model. Consider, for example, course policies. Right? You've seen articles like this flying around the Chronicle and other places for a little while. Course policies like this. What do they say to our students, about our students? How much agency we're willing to grant them? How much we're willing to treat them as adults? But think more broadly. Even if you have an attendance or late policy, what if we involve students in the construction of course policies for the course? I can tell you when I do this, even in the construction of late policies or laptop policies or anything else, when they co-create the policy with me, they own the policy. They police the policy. I do not have to enforce it. And often they're more conservative than I am in terms of the policies themselves. I think we need to bring them in. Or what about learning outcomes? Now, don't get me wrong, there's benefits to be had from working with learning outcomes. And if you're familiar with the principles of backwards course design, from aligning your outcomes to your activities and making sure you're assessing the things that you think you're building in terms of skills. But I do think it's odd, it's odd that students can walk into my class or even before the first day, I can write a syllabus that specifies, here are the learning objectives for the course, right? It's great. So I'm going to tell you what you're going to learn, what the course is going to be like, what we're going to cover before I ever meet you, because God knows you're not going to influence the direction of this class. That's weird. What about involving students in that, even the selection of topics, giving them some ownership over there? Can we give up a degree of agency or at least grant some to them? And what about the learning management system? Canvas, in your case, or Blackboard or Moodle or whatever the flavor of the day is. Audrey Waters is a dear friend, and I love what she writes. She's a fierce critic of educational technology. 
She writes that the learning management system, the LMS, is a piece of administrative software. There's that word management in there that sort of gives it away. That this software that purports to address questions about teaching and learning, but that really works to manage and administer, in turn often circumscribing pedagogical possibilities. And that's how we structure it. Each course is a discrete unit right, in the LMS, as though knowledge is not cumulative and, and, and not uh, 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 interrelated. And what do we do with the LMS? You build your course in Canvas. You load your readings, load your activities. Of course, we use it as a, as a sort of fancy grade book. And then at the end of the semester, what do we do? We scrub any trace of student activity. Yes? Odd? So not only have I told my students at the start of the course that clearly you're not important at all because we're not, you're not going to influence the direction of this course, now I'm confirming for them that you were completely pointless because any trace of your existence in this course is going to be wiped. Why? Why? Why are we not use, using the work of our students, building on it cumulatively? Why are we throwing it away, wiping it away? To me, this is rather appalling. And then we can talk about assessments. Think about things like assignments, like research essays. When a student comes into my upper level class on conservation psychology, for example, I could ask them to write what will be the 18th research essay in the course of their undergraduate degree, or I could go a different tack. Because most traditional assignments are disposable assignments. And they're disposable in the sense of students will spend hours working on, let's say, their next research essay, one person to see. That's it. I'm the only person who's going to see their work. You are the only person who's going to see their work. That's it. And then we spend all of this careful time providing you know, good developmental formative feedback. How can I phrase this in a way that my students are not going to react too poorly? All of this stuff. We take workshops on how to do this. And then maybe 10% of your students will pick up the essay. And maybe 10% of those will actually read the feedback instead of just the mark and moving on. So if you put all of that together, the hours that students spend working on resources for just one person to encounter, and the hours that we spend on providing feedback for almost no one, I'm going to suggest that traditional assignments are actively sucking energy out of the world. So flip it. Students are much more capable. Right? So what if we harness their energy, their potential, even their creativity, and ask them to produce resources for the commons? This is this idea of students as producers, as creators. Incredibly important. If you go back to Freire again, he talks about how people are fulfilled to the extent that they create their world, which is a human world, and they create it with their transforming labor. I want to give you at least six examples of what I mean. Hopefully one of them will resonate with your context. Let's start with the elephant in the room, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an interesting thing. We know people, perhaps we are those people who enforce it's almost like the 11th commandment of academia, isn't it? Thou shalt not cite Wikipedia. We prohibit students from citing Wikipedia. Why? Because we're concerned about unreliability, and we're right to be concerned. I should say that. We are right. In psychology, there's about 8,600 articles on Wikipedia. Okay? About two-thirds of them have undergone Wikipedia's version of peer review, which is not my version of peer review. Yes. And 10% of those articles are considered good articles by Wikipedia standards, which are not my standards. So if you're concerned, you're not wrong to be concerned. At the same time, who is in a better position to fix this resource than us? Who? I find it amazing that as academics, we continue to bury our heads in the sand. We know Wikipedia is the first port of call for our students, yes? And if we're really honest, it's the first port of call for many faculty, for many things. So instead of ignoring it and collectively burying our heads in the sand, why not work with our students? Let's pick articles related to our disciplinary topics, and as part of a course assignment, have them edit, write, update, improve the public resource that is the first port of call for the public. We should be doing this. And thousands of instructors already are. The Wikipedia Education Foundation partners with institutions and instructors, lots of them. Here's one example. Amin Azam, who teaches medical students at the University of California, he does this. And his medical students eventually will be in a position where they have to explain complex medical symptoms, terminology, disorders, syndromes to a layperson in a very short span of time. What better way to practice than by writing medical articles for Wikipedia? And it's more than just writing. 
They're filming videos, adding all sorts of resources. This is their coursework. They get credit for it. This is a public service at the same time. It's incredibly powerful. And a lot of people are doing this. Thousands of students have done this in a variety of disciplines, not just STEM disciplines. Lots of new articles have been created. And of course, even more than that have been edited. Almost everyone who's done it will do it again. If you're unfamiliar with the Wiki Education Foundation, please look them up. They've been running for long enough. They have a suite of resources for us. They have step-by-step -step guides for faculty. How can you construct a course assignment? They have different guides for different disciplines. They have rubrics. They even have a campus Wikipedia ambassador program. I mean, it's crazy. They could not hold our hands anymore. They even have step-by-step -step guides for students and onboarding. It's incredibly easy to do this. Right? I know colleagues who do this in small classes of 25. I have a colleague at the University of Toronto who teaches introductory psychology with 1,500 students in a single section. That section edits Wikipedia. You can do it anywhere. You can do it first year, fourth year, honors, doesn't matter. And if you think that students are going to sort of balk, shy away from performing this kind of public scholarship, think again. These are students from all over the place. The one at the top, my favorite part about writing for Wikipedia was knowing that the information being presented is valuable to someone. They do see a sense of purpose, meaning, and they pour so much more energy into their work when they know it's not going to be seen just by you. This is valuable. It's not busy work. Right? Being encouraged by more than the grade. And I'm not going to read all of the comments, but the one over here is striking to me as well because it's a bit of a reality check. I know that when I publish a peer-reviewed article in an empirical journal, there's far more people who are going to read the work of my students on Wikipedia than will ever read my peer-reviewed article. That's humbling, but that's truth. Right? But let's move away from Wikipedia for a moment. What about this? This was down the road at BYU. There were graduate students taking a course in project management. These were instructional designers in training, and they wanted a book. There was an open textbook which was project management for business. So then, of course, the instructor decided to, to have a course assignment where they took out all of the case studies from business. Each of the students, graduate students, wrote case studies for project management or for instructional design. They filmed videos. They added interactive components. They republished the book. At the end of one semester, these graduate students published a textbook, Project Management for Instructional Design. It's an adaptation. And they've improved it since then, the next cohort. This is a book that's used at other institutions now. It was produced by students, graduate students at BYU. And if you think that it's only graduate students who are capable of doing this work, not so much. Take this example. My friend Robin DeRosa works at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. She teaches early American literature, and she had one of these aha moments where she realized she was assigning an anthology, $100 or so, where all of the readings were in the public domain. So then she took a step back, worked with her students to select the readings that would go into the anthology, and published the open anthology of earlier American literature. Fantastic by itself. And then, of course, you can go further. Look at Ohio State University, where successive cohorts of students taking courses in environmental science have been writing bite-sized chunks. And this has been edited by the faculty at Ohio State. This is published as Environmental Science Bites. This is all open educational resources. These are open textbooks that are being written by students, edited by faculty, provided to the public. Wonderful. Not a throwaway research essay, not a disposable assignment. Another option, we all sometimes have these oral presentations that we include in our courses, right? And I don't know about you, but I've died by PowerPoint far too many times. But what if we substitute those with something else? So instead, we challenge our students to film, produce two to three minute videos, instructional videos that provide an overview of a particular psychological phenomenon, let's say. Right? Be as creative as you like. You can use your iPhone and film a little skit with your friends. You can use animation tools that are free on the web, whatever you like. So these two students at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver submitted their video, which was about the principles of persuasion, to an international student video competition. They won first position, 6,000 US dollars, which is like 50,000 Canadian or something. <laughs> but more importantly, their video is now being used by faculty in Malaysia, in Hawaii, in Vancouver, to teach the science of persuasion. It's that good, and that's powerful. That's open pedagogy, right there. Right? It's wonderful. One more example. Again, what if we ditch the research essay, given that they're going to write so many others? 
in social psychology, I do this, but they do this at Keene State as, oh, sorry, Kent State as well. This is also in New Hampshire. So they ask their students to write and submit for publication an op-ed. Pick a local social problem that's affecting your community. Take your budding scientific knowledge. Make an engaging and evidence-based argument. Very concise, because op-eds are 500 to 750 words. They're not easy to write, actually. But they're exactly the kind of skill I want my students to come away with. Literacy, communication skills, and being able to c communicate clearly to a lay audience. It's wonderful. So this is happening all over the place. Right? And maybe one more example. This is an open textbook, the other open textbook that I worked on for social psychology. And it's great, I think, anyway, clearly. But the problem is, for some open textbooks, these are disciplines or courses for which Traditionally, instructors rely heavily on ancillary materials. And even though there are ancillary materials for many open textbooks, for some, like this one, they're not yet. They do not yet exist. So in particular, I'm talking about a question bank over here. Right? There's some disciplines where this is really important to faculty. But then it eventually occurred to me, why in heaven's name am I asking my students to answer questions when I can ask them to write the questions? Think about how deeply a student has to grasp a concept to be able to write three plausible distractors in a multiple choice question. That's where I started thinking. And so I have small classes, 35 students. So we picked 10 topics over the semester. And my small class, we, they wrote four questions every week. They peer reviewed 12 questions a week. We built it. I had all sorts of incentive structures built in where you know, they knew the best questions would possibly end up on the actual midterm exam. So there's your incentive to write a very good question. And we built 1,400 questions in a single semester. That was last summer. This summer, I had another cohort do the same thing. Now I have 2,800 questions. I'm not saying it's a ready test bank for instructors to adopt. There's some polishing that needs to be done. Not all the questions are phenomenal. But give me one or two more semesters working with students, peer reviewing, editing. We'll get there. But over here, the provision of the resource is not the main goal. It's the pedagogy. It's the learning. It's much deeper when the students are writing the questions. Right? So in trying to give you these examples, whether it's Wikipedia editing, or open textbook adaptation, or authoring, or curation, or instructional video design, or even op-eds, or question writing. I'm trying to give you a range of ideas for assessments that are outside of tradition. And that's because traditional assignments are a lot like having an aircraft and choosing to drive it down the highway. Because you could do that, right, technically. No problem with that. I mean, people will look at you weird. They'll get a lot of side eye. OK, you could do that. But they're capable of so, 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 so much more. And that's the point. Openness as a movement is equal parts about access as it is about agency. So it's about access to students, no doubt, of course. And again, broadly it's construed. But it's also about agency for faculty and agency for students. From, from our perspective, more freedom to be able to modify resources to suit what we want to do. And for students, they can choose. They're not stuck with uh, in a particular format or anything else. And giving them more agency even in the, in, in the process of education itself. And talking about access and talking about agency should remind you of other open movements as well. The open access movement, for example, hinges on a similarly ludicrous state of affairs. Where we take, I mean, just consider this. We take public funding, right, from NIH or whatever it's coming from. That research money comes to the institutions. We do the research, we publish, we, we write up the manuscript, we submit it for publication to a traditional commercial journal, right? And as soon as we're handing it over, when they say, yes, you're accepted, we sign over the copyright. So that our institution, our colleagues next door in the same office cannot access the research that we've done unless your institution subscribes to that database. So that the public that's funded the research that you've conducted hits a paywall when they want to read the research that they have funded. It's quite bizarre. And it's not good enough for us to just say, well, I'm going to gift you a vast profits, billions of dollars of profits in the form of intellectual labor. Just, I'm going to be even more generous. I'm going to volunteer you know, peer review, editorial support, because, of course, we like to help Elsevier whenever we can. The open access movement is ludicrous uh, because it shouldn't have to be a movement. Right? This should be default. Publicly funded resources should be public by default, should be available to the public. This is also true with open science. Right? 
If we're really concerned about reproducibility, we need to share our research materials. We need to pre-register our hypotheses so people know we're not hypothesizing after the results are known, that we're not p-hacking and manipulating the data. We need to do this. We need to share our data openly in repositories to enable cumulative science, and not just for the cancer moonshot, for everything. This is how science proceeds, is in an open and transparent fashion. And this is how education proceeds too. As I write with my friend Robin DeRosa, this, the open education movement, is fundamentally about the dream of a public learning commons, where learners are empowered to shape the world as they encounter it. And one more. I'm constantly inspired by Bell Hooks. If you're unfamiliar with her work, you should really read her work. She writes that engaged pedagogy does not seek simply to empower students, and that any classroom that employs a holistic model of learning will also be a place where teachers grow and are empowered by the process. Again, from my perspective, I've benefited a lot from the open education movement as an educator. It's made me reevaluate how I approach the classroom, the assumptions that I make about my course policies, about resources, yes, but about much more. Right? What is this work about? If my work is simply the banking model of education, I'm replaceable with a video. I'm replaceable with a Khan Academy talk. But I'm not about the content. The content, I think, is the, the gasoline. I'm focused on the engine. The content will change. The content will move. It's the engine I think I need to have my eye on. And this is the way I think we can reach even more of them. I started with this image behind my title slides. I want to come back to it. This is a picture, a photograph that I took when I was in uh, Cape Town in South Africa. Yes, you were right. So that's Table Mountain you're looking at, which is beautiful on occasion when it's not covered with cloud, which they call a tablecloth, which is kind of cute. But what is maybe not immediately obvious is that obviously I'm not in downtown Cape Town. That's downtown Cape Town. I'm standing at the edge of Robin Island. Robin Island first served as a leper colony before it was converted to a maximum security prison for political prisoners. So during the racist apartheid regime in South Africa. This is where, among others, Nelson Mandela spent 18 years of his 27-year prison sentence here. So it really, personally, it was transformative to be able to visit, especially because now every single tour guide on Robben Island is actually a former inmate of the prison. So to be able to talk to them and understand and try and learn, ask them questions about how they may manage to maintain hope, small acts of daily resistance, when the injustice, the inequity was so apparent, so evident, right in front of their eyes every single day. It was really transformative, that moment for me. And that's where I start thinking about the in in incredible power of that moment where the people who had the experience were speaking to it, but at the same time addressing the inequity that was, based in, that, was, that was baked into the system. So again, I'll come back to this. But I really do believe that higher education is a vehicle for economic and social mobility. But we can't leave it to the system. The system will simply replicate the power structures that it's based on. We will think that it's open. Anyone can apply. But we're not thinking about how something as subtle as textbook costs are disproportionately affecting students of color, first generation students, and other marginalized groups. We assume that our courses are accessible, even when it comes to questions at the end of a talk like this. We assume that I don't need a mic when I'm asking a question, but it's not about you. It's about the people in the room who might be hard of hearing, the people at the other campuses who need to listen to the question as well. So I think sometimes with the best of intentions, we end up replicating the power structures that we really ought to be dismantling. Onward together. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope, yes we do. That clock is accurate, I think. We've got 15, perhaps 20 minutes for discussion, thoughts, questions, and please, I would love it if you just shared, even if it's a comment or a thought that maybe was sparked or connected with something I was saying. And we do have a 
a microphone. Thank you, Becky. So I actually thought when you mentioned the elephant in the room that you were going to talk about the promotion and tenure <laughs> yes. process. Oh, good. I feel like that is one of the elephants in the room. So what are your thoughts on the yeah. inherent tension between that, which is so critical to academia, yeah. and the open movement in general, whether it be open access or OER? Yeah, I think that's changing. We're seeing that change quite dramatically. Um, if you look at the open access movement for a moment, there are universities in Germany and the Netherlands which are now mandating open access publications. Uh, certainly in Canada, we have federal funding from tri-council agencies, uh, and you have obviously federal funding over here, which are now starting to mandate that research uh, that is funded by those grants uh, end up in an open repository, even if you're talking about a preprint. So I think at a, at a policy level, that's happening anyway. Even if you're not publishing in a full open access journal, at the very least, you're publishing uh, preprints of your work in an open access repository like you have at uh, USU. Um, talk to Dylan if you want to uh, find out more about that repository. Um, but I should say, even on the OER side, it's changing. So for example, the University of British Columbia, in, in obviously in, in Vancouver, is one of the biggest research institutions in Canada. Uh, earlier this year, they actually passed a uh, policy change for tenure and promotion so that the creation and adaptation of OER now counts towards tenure and promotion at UBC. That's not the only place this is going to happen at. So I think you're going to have to look for this leadership, but it, 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 it is happening already. It's happening especially as people are realizing that even if you're a commercial textbook author, you have zero control over things like the cost of your book to students. There are lots of commercial textbook authors who are very frustrated and attempt to buy back the rights. But as universities like UBC and other research institutions, so not just community colleges, start to see the significant advantages in terms of enrollment, persistence, completion, they realize that they have to align the incentive structures for faculty so that it's not just voluntary labor that's unpaid. Right? This work is funded. It's not unpaid. Right? It rewards people, especially in terms of tenure and promotion, for places that have tenure and promotion for places that don't. Otherwise, whether it's time releases, whether it's grants, whether it's uh, any other kind of uh, recognition, absolutely. But I would say it, it is already changing. It's already happening. Um, and hopefully, it'll follow over here as well. Please, I'm going to try and pass the mic, Daisy chain it. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Another one next week, and then somewhere in October, the third. What one question would you <laughs> ask someone here to ask uh, him, or well, two hymns and one her? Mm -hmm. um, uh, because um, he or she is going to be the person at this institution yeah. that will be uh, driving that or allowing or enabling or whatever. Well, first of all, I should say um, there's a lot, whether you look at, at sort of the annual um, indications about uh, uh, emerging trends, important trends over the next five, 10 years, those kinds of lists that come out, or even if you look at documents from the OECD uh, that talk about the role of, of uh, open educational practices in catalyzing innovation within institutions. Um, I would ask a, pre a question personally about um, uh, how about how they see uh, what benefits they see or how they see uh, open access, open science, and open education uh, benefiting the institution uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a broad, in a micro and macro sense. So I would, I would hope to see some evidence that they are completely familiar with these, which are incredibly important uh, and growing rapidly as movements across higher ed. So for me, it would be a big red flag if they are unaware of any of these movements, and in particular, not just casually aware, but have thought deeply about their implications for our work now and in the future, both in terms of demographic challenges and serving communities as a land-grant institution, but also in, on the innovation side and what that can spark. So I would hope for a lot of familiarity uh, uh, and not just casual. Thank you, though. 
that's a really cool opportunity. Um, but I should say, in the psychology department of my institution, we actually ask potential candidates uh, in search committees very openly uh, about their familiarity and awareness of open educational resources, their use in teaching, and things like that. Um, or if they're on the sort of research side, then of course about open science practices. Because if they don't know about that, you haven't been paying attention in psychology. So yes. Other thought, I don't, it doesn't need to be a question really, but yeah. Well, this, to me, I'm becoming more familiar with this all the time. So then what's the downside? It, the people that would be against this, to me it seems like, why wouldn't everybody be for this? Yep. So obviously I'm thinking publishers. Yep, that's the one side. The ones. Yep. Um, but as far as professors and people in the institution, are most of them supportive? Thanks. Um, well, I think we're wrapping a few things up uh, in one when we talk about supportive. Because there are people who it doesn't matter what you're talking about will be resistant to change of any kind. So there's that issue to deal with. Uh, right? So aside from that, um, yes, the institution wins, faculty win with a few exceptions. So for faculty, if you are, for example, a commercial textbook author and you happen to be in this lovely conflict of interest situation where you're assigning your commercial textbook to your students, then you might be losing. Um, but I think overall, uh, if we're talking about resources that are available, that you deem to be high enough quality, then there's no loser apart from the commercial publishers. I should say though, commercial publishers have a, have a love-hate relationship with OER, which is sort of interesting. Uh, if you've been sort of watching them over the last decade or so, they've been actively rebranding themselves from textbook companies to digital learning solutions companies or whatever they call themselves now. So essentially they're moving away from providing resources to providing services, kind of like Netflix and Spotify and the like. So they're looking for um, institutional licensing deals where they're gonna deliver e-textbooks to all of the students, right? So all in, mandatory across all of the courses. Um, because of course, massive margins, guaranteed revenue from every student, not just the 30% who are buying the books, uh, and every semester, and they're leasing the books so they get it every semester. There's no, text, no, there's no used textbook market to stamp out. So they are actively moving towards digital, massive pivot. You're gonna see that more and more. So when I say love-hate, they love the fact that OER is free in digital formats because they, that is assisting the pivot to digital among faculty in terms of familiarity with digital. Uh, of course, OER is available in print too, uh, but that's not the point. So they are actively importing open educational resources into some of their repositories, which is a sort of legally dubious practice uh, because you're charging for resources that actually should be free. Um, so they kind of love it, but they kind of hate it. They hate it to the extent that it's cutting their margins right now and hammering them right now. Pearson saw a 30% drop in their stock value in February of this year because of this. Um, but yeah, so I think you're going to see them shift more and more so that they sort of, they're still co-opting much of the movement. You will also see a lot of what we call open washing. It's kind of like green washing. You know, sort of companies that market environmentally friendly practices, but it's a marketing slogan. It's not actually embedded in their ethos or culture in any way. Um, but yes, I think in, in terms of people who are against it, you'll get people who are, um, not terribly excited about the unfamiliar, who are very happy with doing um, things the way they've been doing it for 10, 20 years, and that's fine. So as long as we respect agency, including faculty agency, and we do not mandate any of this, then, it, then it's still a win even for them, I think. But yes, for the time being, commercial publishers absolutely despise the movement. Yeah. Interesting times. Do you mind passing it back now? Thank you. Yeah. This is, uh, I had an, I'm just gonna throw this out and see kind of what your response is. I had an interesting conversation a while ago, well, not a conversation, I was sitting in a seminar, but at a, there's one of the sort of more non-traditional higher ed um, institutions that exist in the state and offers content um, and, uh, you know, education through, you know, more competency-based kinds of means. Right. And I, you know, they have entire um, offices that are devoted to content. And one of the questions I asked was, you know, how do you, 
what's your take on OER? Do you attempt to integrate OER with what you do? And it was interesting, their response was like, well, we're, we're really hesitant about adopting OER because we don't want to get halfway through um, a, uh, you know, a, a subscription period and then something happens and bam, it's, you know, shut down, that website's gone or whatever. Which to me seemed a little bit odd. Like, it seemed like there might be um, ways to get around that. But I'm curious, just from like a, a, a practical standpoint, what are some things, if you're using OER, yeah. that you can do to ensure the durability yeah. uh, and the continuity of yeah. your content? Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. That actually strikes me as a rather bizarre answer from that individual. Um, OER is defined, as I said, by permissions. And one of the permissions is retain. So, in fact, if it constitutes OER, you can automatically, immediately download it in editable fashion um, onto your server, your platform, your LMS, your website fully, and you can permanently retain it. So, I'm really confused about what they're talking about. Um, I mean, I can get that you can certainly use OER that's hosted on the provider's website, whether it's OpenStax, which is based at Rice University, or BC Campus in Vancouver, or anything else. But for all of that, you're able to download it and archive it yourself. That's one of the foundations of open licensing. So to me, I'm partly wondering whether they just are unfamiliar with that or what's going on. Um, but let me give you a concrete example. Um, you may have heard of a company called Boundless. Uh, they were also a creative OER for a long time. And uh, earlier this summer, they announced that they were no longer going to be in the OER space. But they have a lot of OER content that's out there. And a lot of people use it or remix it in other ways. And people use it on Boundless's website. But because it's OER, uh, lots of individuals, including Lumen Learning, David Wiley's company, went in, downloaded, archived, imported all of their courses to create a permanent uh, archive. And that's being mirrored in a few places. So even when the company goes completely poof, this continues. The resource exists. And that's part of the big argument for, for, for funding this, is because when you, in BC, we, we spent a million dollars five years ago to produce resources, open textbooks for the 40 highest enrolled undergraduate courses. And we've saved students about $5 million to date. And it doesn't matter if BC campus, which is a government funded agency, suddenly just disappears. Um, the resources exist, they're out there. They're hosted all over the place. They can be replicated. So, I have to say, the resources, the nature of open resources ensures that they retain forever, well beyond. They're not tied to a single institution in any way. And remember, to download, you do not need permission. You can do it directly. And if you can't, it's not OER. <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks for asking that, though. It's odd. Even the FET simulations from Colorado, which are simulations, can be downloaded. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, heavens. Sorry. Can we do a bit of a daisy chain, Becky? Backward? Thank you. Thanks. Um, so you, you cited both um, Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire, who I assign readings from them to my students. And um, I actually make them purchase the books from Rutledge or Westview Press or whoever it is. Sure. Is there a, a movement where um, chapters or entire selections from these kind of social justice authors can be moved into an open, open resource space? And I mean, what are the implications of, of, you know, in education, oftentimes I'll, I'll provide a PDF of a chapter from one of these books. Fair dealing. To my, yeah, and say, oh, look, it's fair use because it's education. Yeah. But what, what are your thoughts about how can we get some of these great, I mean, like Paulo, he's, he's yeah. dead, right? So how do you, you ask the estate to maybe move those? You know, no, it's just copyright law, right? Yeah, so right. It, whatever, 70 years after the author's death, oh, actually it varies by country, so I, I can't tell you. Becky could, Becky, yeah, so 70 years. After Paolo's death, it would enter the public domain. Um, in most cases, that's the, that's the truth. There are exceptions to this, um, like Mickey Mouse, for example. Every time Mickey Mouse comes up into the public domain, they extend copyright uh, uh, periods. It's ridiculous. But, um, but yeah, I think, so I think, first of all, uh, there are lots of creative writers, authors who are alive today. Um, and this is not about, open licensing is an alternative that's available to them if they want it. But uh, no one would want to take away their livelihoods by, by mandating that or sucking that away. I mean, this is why people, uh, authors hated the, the Google Books importation project. Um, but so fair dealing is fine, but it doesn't, that's not open licensing, of course. Uh, and, and so 
for authors who are actively writing right now, uh, what I would do is I would point them to a book that was published by Creative Commons earlier this year. It's called Made with Creative Commons. And it profiles about 20 different business models, including for writers and authors, um, for how they can take advantage of open licensing and truly benefit economically. So I would want to make sure that authors are aware of this new business model. But beyond that, I would never want to take away any kind of royalty for, for, from someone who, want, who bases their livelihood on it. Um, so I would say, yeah, fair dealing, wait until something enters the public domain, uh, and then go from there. You can always, of course, if the author is alive, beyond fair dealing, you can reach out to the author, explain what you're using it for, and proactively obtain permission from them. You might even be surprised. They might give you limited permission for use in your classes uh, uh, because it resonates so much with what they're trying to achieve. But no, I think um, there's many ways to address affordability. Um, fair dealing is one. Uh, even taking a, a, a tougher stance when you're negotiating prices with commercial textbook publishers is another one. And I would recommend you consider your power there as well. But yeah. But look for the book, Made with Creative Commons. Uh, Corey Doctorow is one of the authors I'm thinking of. Who's, who's, who's profiled in the book. Thank you. We have time for maybe one other question before it officially gets to the end, or a comment. Yes, please, Nick. Um, so I don't feel uh, engineering really fits into academia very well in, <laughs> in many ways. Um, and so with, uh, with resources like OpenStax, um, when I've looked for textbooks, we really like to teach out of textbooks. There aren't a whole lot of engineering textbooks on there. Um, do they, or any, I guess, open educational resource publisher like them, offer sabbatical type mm. opportunities to actually generate content and produce yeah. or publish a textbook? Such a, that's like a perfect question to finish <laughs> with. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to backtrack and say beyond textbook type projects, and there's many in BC and universities and OpenStax is another one. Uh, there's other projects that are open, that are OER. One I will point you in the direction of is called Libre Texts. So this is based at the University of California at Davis, but it's um, imagine Wikipedia where students are writing the articles, but junior students' work is edited, supervised, um, reviewed by senior students. Their work edited, supervised, reviewed by graduate students. Their work overseen by an international board of faculty. Not anyone can edit it. It's controlled. Um, and they've been doing this for a long time, in starting in chemistry and then expanding. So that's the kind of resource that I see emerging more quickly to support it, uh, uh, engineering. Um, so I would reach out to uh, the guy who runs it. His name is Delmar Larson. Uh, he's, I think, an associate professor of chemistry at UC Davis. Um, it's amazing. This is the most visited chemistry website in the world, and it's been built by students. Very cool. Um, so I would reach out to them. But in terms of models, there's so many models for support to be able to do this. So of course, in-house, uh, you have a grant program that's now running uh, and hopefully you can apply for some funding uh, even if it's not an enormous amount of funding to help you do some work you can hire a student assistant and who can help you with some of this work as well perhaps um, another big thing though is i think the movement is quickly moving away from smaller projects that have big funding to community driven projects so one community i will point you to is the rebus community rebus is r-e-b-u-s and this is for all disciplines not just uh, engineering where this is a, 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 a community of people who are faculty who are interested in open educational resources. Either perhaps they don't exist in a particular discipline, or maybe if they ex exist, there's no ancillaries, or there's something else missing, something needs to be done. It's a space where people from different, multiple institutions can come together um, and work together collaboratively to develop peer review and refine those resources. So I would say working with Rebus, you can really, you know, many hands will make light work, but through peer review, the product will be superior. Um, there's, uh, I would also look at your professional societies. Often they have grant funding available to support creation and dissemination of teaching resources. Um, there are wider projects. So you could, for example, have a conversation with OpenStax. And if this is a course that is widely taught, uh, at many institutions anyway, and they can see uh, a business model for themselves, they might support and fund a collaborative development uh, for a textbook like that. They're not the only shop that would possibly do that. BC Campus might do that as well, for example. Um, and then I would look at uh, many of the existing levels that you can. So, so at my institution, faculty have the equivalent of sabbatical, paid educational leave is what we call it, essentially. 
Um, and there's ways for faculty to apply uh, for that um, time release, um, whether it's a semester or a full year, to be able to work on open projects. But I think the more you can collaborate and you're not doing it by yourself and perhaps pooling together funding, uh, and if you find other schools that have programs that are known for what you're trying to develop, this is where you want to go. Uh, there are so many schools that are involved in this. Um, uh, you know, whether it's Oregon State or UMass Amherst or the SUNY system or Purdue or uh, Tennessee Knoxville. I mean, I, I can go on. There's like 600 campuses in this country that are doing this, that have grant programs for this. There's got to be collaborators for you. So, um, and of course, beyond that, I'll just invite anyone, if you don't know where to start looking for collaborators or you, or you just uh, want help finding collaborators, I would be very happy to do that. There's uh, uh, lots of listservs where I can sort of reach out and put out calls. There's somebody I know who's interested in collaborations for this, potentially for that. We can do that. Um, so reach out. Um, there will be internal opportunities, external opportunities, uh, and then ultimately, you know, we'll produce it. But yeah, but thanks again very much. There's catering that's quietly snuck in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.